the last couple of months, CCS was was quite quite uh, strongly discussed uh, in the Swedish newspapers as well. And I would be very curious to to hear your opinion about about CCS as a technology, um, the the likeliness that it will come into play a role in our energy system, um, and your view on, on on how the technology or how where the technology might come in. Uh, maybe in your respective uh, industrial field. Um, so is there someone that, that wants to start with that? Uh, uh, thoughts about... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe I, I could start uh, because CCS has, um, if we're talk, talking about CCS, it, that has been one of kind of the major topics in uh, the energy industry for quite a number of years. Of course, uh, I mean, if we're talking about Europe, a lot of uh, the uh, power uh, production in Europe is done via hard coal or, or lignite. And, of course, there is a demand for CCS. Uh, uh, and what, ha what then happened uh, is, uh, of course, as you all know, is a kind of a collapse of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, trading systems here. So... Uh, going from like 30 euros down to five, I think, I don't know, I haven't looked today, but I think there are probably around five euros per ton. Of course, had a, an enormous impact on uh, our industry. I mean, we have large plans for building CCS plants. Uh, we had pilot plants uh, operating around the clock, uh, to produce, just producing uh, data to allow us to, to scale up and so on. And then overnight, more or less, everything collapsed. Uh, so I told some, some of you, the last thing, I was working in Germany for five years, and the, one of my last tasks on the innovation department in Aeon was to kind of close down the CCS activities, more or less, uh, overnight. Because we, we started in 2008, having a budget to land 30 million euros for CCS, and when I left, it was like two, year, two million euros, and closing down. So I can, that's a kind of the uh, low note. Um, but I think what has been produced in, 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 in the past and what we still, I think there is still a, a bright future. I don't, to be honest, I don't really see a, a future for CCS in Europe uh, uh, in the energy industry. But I think there is still a, uh, if, I, th I think there is still a possibility, especially in the industry. Uh, uh, and we had very large hopes for the US uh, but uh, taking into account now the uh, kind of the governance in in the U.S., I, I doubt if there actually it will be a large uh, uh, market for CCS. So I think there might be a future for CCS in the industry still, and in especially in CUT in <coughs> intensive industries like the petrochemical chemical industry, uh, metallurgical industry, uh, cement, and so on. Um, but I think there is uh, electrification is also c coming into this pic picture. So I think that in total, I'm, I'm not too optimistic about CCS. Uh, there, there might be some kind of possibilities also using CO2 as a raw, raw material in the future if uh, some kind of value can be assigned to CCS. I think that that might also be a possibility for CCS. If I shall continue after a lot well said, firstly, I think I'm again impressed by Chalmers and the competence and the, um, the variety of uh, research that is being done here. Uh, from my point of view, in a chemical industry competing on a global scene, we believe that CCS is not possible unless there is a global commitment on a, on a similar CO2 price. And that shall, as always, has also been on quite a high level in order to be practical in, in this technology that it works. And more uh, sort of generally, CCS means that we first contaminate with something and then invest in cleaning it up. It might be better to focus more on being right from start to, to have more effort on the non-fossil CO2 molecules, putting them in in a quicker pace than first continue to use fossil molecules and then invest in cleaning them up. But uh, from sort of a chemical industry perspective, CCS is not a major technology that we study, and I'm not so optimistic either. 
Oh, I can continue. I, um, I, I agree with the previous speakers, um, but I do realize it and I do think that this is a very interesting technology. And I think the earlier that we, that, that we can build up an infrastructure around CCS uh, will be beneficial but because in the long run, I, I, I have difficulty in seeing uh, us moving towards uh, the, the 22nd century without uh, this technology. Uh, however, as, as being a representative for a, um, for a uh, on a global scale, small, privately owned company, we cannot do this on our own. Um, we, we need to, uh, th there needs to be some sort of uh, economical drivers to, uh, to engage in this technology. And, um, and also, uh, there is also a need for <coughs> a, a bigger um, a commitment from, uh, from uh, EU or, or, or a conglomerate of states to, to make sure that there, are, that, that there is an infrastructure in place to take care of uh, the, the uh, CO2 once it's, uh, it's been captured. I have a problem in uh, exactly as Lars is pointing out in seeing any other problem uh, or perceived uh, threat to be solved by inventing a dump site, which is actually what we are talking about uh, as long as we don't have the utilization end of the carbon capture uh, concept. Uh, we will not see the, the uh, storage dump site if it's a, kilome a kilometer uh, below ground out in the North Sea. But uh, basically, we need to, to find a way to utilize the CO2 where it's then stored permanently uh, out of the atmosphere if, if uh, such a use will come, there will be an, another drive and uh, another willingness to invest in it than to uh, put it away. But don't forget that there are some other technologies than the, the, the pure engineer solutions that we have uh, seen. There is something called uh, photosynthesis. Uh, maybe, maybe we should actually take the take the trouble and plant, plant another uh, set of trees per inhabitant in EU. Uh, further increase the uptake of, of CO2 from the atmosphere. That has been calculated to have a cost of 8 to 10 euros per ton of CO2 captured from the atmosphere. And that is available technology that ca that is not depending on it has to be at a certain location. There are plenty of, of spare locations where additional biomass can be storing carbon from the atmosphere. I think you, you address very nicely um, the, the necessity um, to, to basically take CO2 out of the atmosphere and, and find it in, in form of photosynthesis, which is some, somehow inherent in the, in the, in the idea of, of bio-CCS. Do you have a specific thought of this? Are we going to, to manage with our, our carbon, available carbon roof that we have, that we select, which is in some sense limited, depending on the two degree uh, um, <clears throat> goal that we have set up or are we going to to need to have negative co2 emissions to to keep in check there and is is bio ccs and in, in your eyes there there the right solution to go or or is it rather to take the hard fall if i if i put my view on it first i think the natural bio ccs growing plants in the nature with sunshine, water, and carbon dioxide. That's the bio CCS that I prefer, not the technical one. Well, 
I think I agree to that. I don't think it's a long-term technology. There may be business cases around in certain places where it makes good sense, as we have seen it here. But on a general, I think we need to stabilize the CO2 by stop emitting no new fossil CO2 and have a, a larger biosphere to, to consume it. Is this going to be realistic? In your, I, because I, I mean, I mean, as considering the amounts of of, of, of fossil we're, we're using, and and and, uh, and and the petrochemical industry and the material production uh, like cement and and iron and steel, is this is this is this coming into play? So, meaning, following up on the question, are we going to? Is it realistic that we keep our our CO two level up, uh, like the, the the roof that we that we did set up, or is it is this something that we kind of we still keep it up and say like, yeah, we are going to, to do this, but we will not manage. I mean, this is a little bit the consequence that I would like to do. Well, to, to, um, to I, I think uh, uh, from a company perspective, we, we cannot do this without an economy, uh, economic incentive. Uh, we will go yeah. bankrupt, basically. Um, I mean, uh, I, <coughs> I appreciate that it only costs... Uh, one, uh, I can't remember the numbers, 120 to 250 kroners per liter in additional costs. But uh, we're talking about very low margins. We're talking about margins about uh, 20 Swedish euro. Uh, and, and, and sort of making the companies pay 120 to 250 by themselves, that won't be possible. So there must be some sort of uh, economic incentive in, in, in order to make this uh, fly. But I mean, Prem has, has got some low hanging fruits in terms of, of uh, possi possible locations for, um, uh, for capturing, uh, where it can be rather cheap. I mean, we have, some, we have uh, um, steam methane reformers where the concentration of CO2 is quite high, where, I mean, it's could be uh, not as costly as, as flue gases, but still, this is nothing that we can do, cannot do by ourselves. I don't know, Philip, yes. may I borrow one of the microphones here? I mean, the, this discussion clearly proves, of course, that the challenge is not really the technology, but obviously the, the uh, yeah, policy measures or, or so. But uh, nevertheless, I, I think that what I wanted to convey with one or two of my slides was, of course, the tremendous amount of fossil fuel used and, and uh, what is, uh, to answer your question back, what, what would you think, maybe not with your specific companies, what, how should society handle this enormous use of fossil fuels? Uh, I mean, because the alternative, as I said, to CCS, I myself rather pessimistic to if CCS will be realized, but I mean, the alternative, if we're staying with this Climate target is to leave the fossil fuels in the ground. And we see very little tendency to that that, that is done. So uh, what is your idea on that? Well, I, th I don't think this is a, a actually an industrial uh, issue or a, a, a scientific issue anymore. This is purely a political issue. It's about political willpower and being able to to uh, set the real political targets, being able also to find some kind of global incentives for, for getting us kind of get coming to grips with the uh, climate issue. And to be beyond this, this is, has been going on ever since Kyoto, and uh, so I think we need some new thinking in this also. And uh, I liked uh, Anders' idea about kind of finding new ways of of. Um, um, of kind of pushing the costs all the way to the consumer because the pr producer of raw materials, the margins are so low there, but the margins are really between the producer and the consumer. So if you somehow could find incentives uh, to uh, find political ways of kind of putting taxes on, on these kind of in-betweens, in I think that that would be a kind of new way of thinking. Uh, maybe a possible way forward. 
Well, <clears throat> again, I agree. I think a, a global high tax on CUT would solve the problem, and then both CCS and both of our bio-based technologies would be profitable by, by themselves. But that vision, I think, is far beyond what we can uh, figure out in this room. But I in that case, CCS might work. Uh, but we must remember also that more than 90% of the fossil oil and fuel used in the world are used as fuels. They are combusted either in power plants or in vehicles, in billion of exhaust pipes all over. And CCS will not help there. So I think all the other measures we do in efficiency and replacing the use of fossil oil is more relevant than, than trying to extract it from the atmosphere and put it back in the ground again. Anders, you know that. Yeah, uh, firstly, I mean, I, I totally agree here. We, I mean, we, we, we're, we're looking into the future as, as researchers and we have, we have to expect that we will be able to solve the climate issue and this can only be solved with a, with a very high price on CO2 and so we have to assume that there will come incentives. Otherwise we can give up our work and stop doing research. Uh, that's, that's my first point. The other point is, is when it comes to, to uh, negative emissions, I believe that the, even, even uh, the pathway I presented previously in science four days ago, uh, the paper I mentioned, uh, the pathway includes lowering the CO2, fossil CO2 emissions by 50% each decade. That's a very rapid decrease. First 50%, then 50%, then 50%, decade by decade. And still we need very large negative emissions, even if we reduce our emissions so fast. And we're talking about, I mean, the IPCC models on negative emissions, we're talking about 500 gigatons or so totally. And, and like 10 or 20 uh, gigaton per year, which, which translates to one or two tons per person on this earth. So it's, I don't think it's really storable in, in materials. We, we need to put it underground also. And it's not so very expensive. And, and Sweden has very large capacity for this. I, I think the, the really big thing is to keep as much as possible still underground and not uh, to f phase out the use of the fossil molecules as fast as possible. But that requires a huge number of different good progress. Uh, and uh, as a comment to the EU ETS, uh, there is al always the, the discussion about it collapsed, but actually it was a tremendous success because uh, the emissions turned out to be lower than what was expected and that causes, caused a decrease. Of course, the allocation of emission allowances were based on the wrong basis. So it was too much allocated. But the emissions turned out in reality to be lower than what was accepted as the expectation. And that's why the price has gone down. And I think we might look back uh, very soon and say it was a joint failure uh, to lobby for a trading system and not accept from the beginning a tax. Have you seen anything being so interesting for industry or companies to avoid as a tax? That's where brains are being used to avoid taxes. So if, if there would have been a tax implemented on a global scale, uh, then pe people would have tried to reduce the tax basis. Yeah, I, but I think that, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't really matter. I agree, in principle, of course, the EVTS works because it's supply and demand based, so that's correct. But I do think that 
that global uh, CO2 tax or CO2 or price or emissions global, it won't happen. So I, I still think that these new or some sort of new thinking around uh, trying to visualize uh, the, the actual price of carbon mitigation in the end products, that must be a key. Uh, because after all, it seems that this will be a very low price increase. But the problem is, of course, it has to be transparent and it has to be, of course, customers who want these products. But we today see a lot of initiatives. For instance, the Swedish Road Administration has a program they strive for carbon neutrality by the year 2030, meaning that when they procure cement and steel, they look at, will increasingly look into this. And I think also, as I mentioned, uh, in various areas, there is already a, a driving force of, of yeah, looking at the carbon uh, footprint. So I would, would be interested to hear in your industries, what would you think that the customer, um, because never, we can agree, I think, on that at the day, uh, end of the day, it's the customer that pays any cost increase. So uh, if I may call it the customer-driven, uh, so to say, wanting green products, do you think there is any hope in that? Or? No, I think uh, <coughs> customer-driven um, uh, response to this is, is a way to go. I mean, and we can see that now the proposal for uh, uh, the reduction system in Sweden that was proposed uh, last week. The incentives there is four kroners per kilogram emitted. So it surpasses this. So our focus and our investments are going is going to go to what you've been saying uh, so far, to um, to the raw material. So we wanna we wanna put our investments into being able to produce renewable um, fuels. That is that is more economically sound as to CCS at the moment. Uh, I think your comment and question is very, very interesting. And here again, we need to differ a lot between the fuel side and the product material side. Because in the fuel, there are various regulations. There are either mandates or there are tax reduction systems to support them that make them uh, competitive in a way within that frame. For a chemical, there is no such thing. So that means that if you either have a CCS system that costs additional money, or you have a raw material that is more expensive, the end product will also be more expensive. And the question is, if we as consumers are willing to pay more for products in order to have a, a lower carbon footprint on them, and then we are not talking about specific products, take the cars that we use, or the clothes that we use, or the hygiene products we use, or the electronics we use, they contain certain amounts of chemicals that are produced somewhere, either in China or in the US or in, in Europe, and if the European would be more expensive because we had CCS, would the, the mass market consume them? I think that's a question we need to ask ourselves. And, and yes, we think there is an emerging market for more expensive products if they have a climate label of some kind. But it is coming very, very slowly and we don't have it yet. I think I open up the, the possibility for a question, but unless this. Uh, yeah, I want to come back to negative emissions again. Uh, I think it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a matter of choice between uh, reducing fossil emissions and having negative emissions. We absolutely need both because it's already too late to only reduce the fossil emissions. If we had started that 20 years ago, we could have met the climate targets, but it's, it's now too late. We have to take back the CO2 we have already emitted. And, and I believe geological storage is, is absolutely the, the long-term safest way of doing this. But we need to do it in many ways, both afforestation and reforestation. We need to, we need to capture the CO2 that's coming out from, from uh, biofuel, uh, biofuel or, or combustion uh, uh, plants. I think that that will be needed and it will be uh, with the CO2 prices, we need to have to solve the problem. It will be a large asset, all the CO2 emissions we already have. 
we should use that to, to, to remove the CO2 we have previously emitted to the atmosphere during the last 100 years. I have a question about what happens when we have now storage all the CO2, and not all, but some of the CO2 in the underground, and, some, and suddenly something happens, for instance, in Iceland, uh, there's a volcano area, and something else happened to the ground, and it starts leaking. What are the risks? I think it's uh, interesting that you brought up Iceland because uh, Iceland has a very favorable uh, geology for carbon storage. They normally, when you store uh, geologically store carbon dioxide, it it stays for for many thousands of years as a liquid because it's high pressure. But in Iceland, the basalt formations makes the they turn into uh, a solid rock in in less than two years. So it, it's it's uh, it's very good. Uh, place for storing CO2. The problem is, of course, the location of Island, Iceland and, and uh, in relation to our power plants, but there are lots of basalt formations worldwide. Then, of course, uh, this is, uh, of course, a uh, uh, public acceptance point that if you store uh, carbon dioxide geologically, uh, there is, of course, some risk for some leakage, but it will be very slow and uh, and uh, um, these are very well uh, investigated uh, storage sites uh, that are, for instance, in the uh, below uh, sea floor in the uh, northern sea. So, so it's a very, very small risk for for that something happens. Of course, onshore storage has met uh, quite some resistance, in, for instance, in Germany among the public. So. Uh, it's of course uh, it's a it's a task to uh, to uh, but not offshore. It seems to be quite good conditions for that. One other thing, but one should remember that natural gas and other gases we have in the ground is also stored in the same way. And in Germany, for example, a lot of the storage of natural gas is done in even much grounder. Uh, storage sites, which is then much high risk for, and even in Austria and so on. One of the biggest storage for natural gas is just below Berlin and has been so for decades. Yeah, I would say storage in forests are probably more risky in that sense, in terms of long-term integrity and permanence and so on. So uh, that's, that's an option that is not providing a big volume solution compared to CCS, and it's also quite uncertain. Yeah, uh, <coughs> CO2 moves very slowly in sandstone. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, I should have brought the piece of sandstone to show you. And, and, and for CO2 to move uh, through sandstone and up a kilometer through, through uh, if there is a leakage, the CO2 will not move very quickly. There will not be large dangerous leaks. I mean, the dangerous leaks could be rather with the pipeline transportation, but, but not, not, I mean, and there's, there's a lot of example worldwide of, of uh, natural CO2 leaks in, in many, many places because CO2 is, is emitted constantly from the ground. But the point here is to inject EU CO2 in, in informations where, where there is a, a, a cap rock, a sealed rock on top. And, and I believe the greatest fears for, for leakage is, is uh, actual wells that have been drilled for oil, etc., that, that they will leak when, uh, because of not being properly sealed. So if, if, if I could choose, I would happily live above a CO2 storage. Yeah, I think what is what is very coming up in, in, in your discussion is what was very the necessity that we have some kind of CO2 tax or 
a different price for, for, for CO2. I mean, then the interesting question is for each of each of your your industries you're representing, or for for different industries industries in, in, in Sweden and globally. Will we rather go into CCS or will we rather go into into biorefineries? And if we go into biorefineries, will we end up in a we cannot do BEX and biorefineries at the full scale if we use like all all the bio biomaterials that are there and utilize the CO2 that we want to store. So, so I mean, we're ending up in, 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 in having a very tight budget in, in that sense. But, but assuming that there is a taxation coming, um, what is, what is the, the, the foremost or the first reaction that basically what, what your, <coughs> your respective industry would react on and in which, which way? What, what would you, you think of would it rather be? Uh, you, you addressed it in some way, Matthias. Maybe you can, you can elaborate a little bit on that. First of all, um, there needs to be a infrastructure in place uh, in order to, in order to um, be able to store it underground. So that needs to be in place first bef before we can do an investment. Then there needs to be an infrastructure around the logistic part. So there needs to be pipelines, uh, ships that can transport it to the loca to storage locations. But in terms of technology, I mean. We work together with the uh, Philips uh, group uh, uh, in researching in, in uh, liquid ammonia and, and traditional CCS. So the technology side is, I mean, that's all already there. We are basically doing CCS today in our biorefinery in Gothenburg, where we uh, uh, at least capture the, the, the CO2, even though it's renewable CO2. Um, so if there is an ec uh, economical incentive and there is an infrastructure in place, we, uh, I don't see how, why we shouldn't be investing in this as well. And uh, going with Anders' um, note that uh, we need to, uh, to build up the infrastructure around being able to have negative emissions, um, then you can combine uh, biorefining with CCS in order to uh, capture the, um, the sort of the bio CO2 emitted uh, from from uh, producing um, biofuels. So, in the long term, or if there is a, a, an incentive in terms of uh <coughs> uh, revenue that can be made, of course, then it's possible. Uh, well, talk, representing the energy, you know, the energy industry, I think we are now moving more or less away from coal. So this might be a surprise to you, but um, so we are not only selling our power plants, which we're also doing, but we're also closing down a lot of the coal-fired coal power stations in Europe, not due to uh, technical reasons, but more or less due to low electricity prices, a lot of plants have been are now re approaching their end of life and it's not really worth doing any reinvestments in coal anymore. So a lot of, you will see a lot of coal-fired power plants in Europe being closed down. And of course the nuclear power plants will also be phased out because we, you can't do any reinvestments in them. And uh, so I think the large-scale era for uh, the utilities is more or less reaching an end now. No reinvestments will be done in coal-fired power plants. No reinvestments in um, in uh, nuclear plants. Hydro plants will, of course, still be, be going like they have done the last 150 years, more or less the same turbines, the same generators, just going. Uh, and then, of course, the investments will be done in solar and, uh, and and in wind. So I think there will be an expansion in the offshore wind area. Uh, area. And all, of course, also in small-scale power, but uh, I, I don't really. And also, the, the coal-fired power plants that are still we, will be in operation will be more or less operating peak loads, and so it will not really motivate uh, investments in CCS as I see it for the moment. This might be changed by a CO2 tax, of course, but for the moment, I don't see any really big investments in CCS. Well, 
assume that there is a declaration in UN tomorrow that there is a, a high CO2 fee imposed all over the globe, making a barrel of oil cost at least $200 at all times, then I think all the things we discuss have would suddenly become uh, profitable and there would be a sound competition between Lisbeth's cell factories and the thermal gasification and the CCS and all of them might fit in different places in the world and the market would solve the problem that the best technology at that location would win. But as long as fossil oil is cheaper, we need to find these kind of suboptimizations all the time with mandates or with uh, various uh, issues like we, we discuss here. And uh, I think that's maybe depressingly the fact that we have to live with and adjust. And the positive thing here, I think, is if consumer power demands for sulfate products and fuels, that is the best way forward right now. I think it depends for us very much on how the electricity market develops. What is the long-term electricity price expectation? Because that will guide how much we are uh, electrifying what is today fueled by, by solid biofuel in order to uh, free up biomass for other uses. So there, and of course, the first thing that drops off is uh, electricity generated from, from biomass. Uh, that is the first thing that happens if there is a low uh, expectation on electricity price. And that we can see happening already. We are limiting the power generation uh, in our CHP, bio-based CHP plants. Uh, already because uh, it's more valuable to, to uh, sh ship the uh, b solid biomass to a district heating plant than to, to convert it to electricity in a pulp or paper mill. So uh, reducing the amount of combustion, uh, that's the first thing that happens. And then similar, uh, at the same time, the next topic on the agenda the energy efficiency part will get a new life uh, and a boost and there will be a generation shift in some unit operations uh, that are available where available technology exists but it requires a boost to get uh, a premature reinvestment cycle going. So even though you were doing a very nice introduction for Simon, uh, coming in about one, one minute. Um, Philip requested the, the, the final word. <laughs> Philip. It wasn't my intention to be <laughs> no. one, but uh, No, I just respond to, I agree with Uwe that, of course, in Europe, uh, I mean, Europe has come quite far when it comes to uh, decarbonize. So, of course, there's a tremendous expansion in renewables. But if you look at Europe, actually, among these regions that I showed about how much fossil assets, uh, Europe has quite little fossil fuels. So, of course, we can expect Europe to be green in that sense. Uh, but you just need to go to Poland, which is a part of Europe that, in fact, has a lot of fossil fuel, although Europe as a whole has a small fraction of it. And they oppose uh, strongly uh, climate-specific yeah, targets. So I think that that's sort of the, the, the irony or the, the problem that, that these regions that have these large assets, they tend to use them. And I think that it has to start somehow by us all wanting demand for, for green products. And I think that Sweden and, and uh, Nordic countries have good conditions for, for being forerunners in this. Maybe that was some, some Concluding words. somewhat uh, <laughs> uh, depressing uh, session. Maybe that was uh, some <laughs> positive <laughs> <ending. Yeah. laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.